Hello, welcome to the Gluten Free RN podcast. Today on episode nine, we're going to talk about the benefits of a paleo diet or some variation of a paleo diet and how a paleo diet can actually help you get better faster. Some of us don't actually like the term paleo anymore. It's a little outdated, but we're going to talk about the basics of a excellent diet, food choices, and how to get better faster. Because the reality is, is that some of us deal with people that are really, really sick, and we have to get them better faster, and some variation of a paleo diet can do that. Hello, I'm Nadine Griskoyak, the Gluten-Free RN, and very happy to be here today talking about a paleo diet. But first, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me as we discuss some very important topics related to gluten intolerance and celiac disease. But first, I'd like to thank my friends at the Pulse Media Network, my team of healthcare professionals that also do podcasting that helped me get the Gluten-Free RN podcast up and running. And now we're on the ninth episode. I'd also like to send a special shout out to my executive producer and editor, Tim Holloway of The Podcasting Guy. He is amazing. If you ever want to start a podcast, he's the guy. Contact him and find him at www.thepodcastingguy. Thank you for joining us today for episode nine. Today, we're going to discuss the paleo diet and why it might be the best option for you if you are looking to regain your health or just to maintain good health. So hopefully you are the very least on a gluten-free, casein-free diet at this point. You're getting better and you're hitting a bit of a plateau. And I used to say that as far as people would get better, but only to a certain point, and then they would kind of get stalled or stop getting better or other things would crop up that they hadn't really paid attention to before, but now they were things that were still nagging at them as far as being a health issue. What is a paleo diet? Let's get that out of the way right away because sometimes I forget to tell people. Like, what is a paleo diet? And it is the number one question people ask. The basis of a paleo diet is to avoid refined sugars, all grains, including rice and corn, vegetable and seed oils. So things like canola and Crisco and any trans fats are pretty much not on a paleo diet. So we're focusing on super good fats, which we'll talk about. Processed foods, legumes, which includes peanuts. So legumes are beans. So any beans, kidney beans, black beans, those type of beans, usually the hard beans that you have to soak in water. And then peanuts. Peanuts are also a legume. So we're avoiding those. And of course, dairy. And some people will still have butter or clarified butter, which is ghee, but most of us cannot do that. It's the protein that is still in the dairy. And for some reason, some of us are still super sensitive to anything to do with dairy, even the clarified ghee. So those are the foods to avoid. But really, the first and foremost question is, what can we eat? That's what everybody wants to know. Because really, if you take those things out, a lot of people go, hmm, forget it. There's nothing to eat. I'm panicked already. I have no idea what I'm going to cook my family for dinner tonight. What am I to do? And they get the deer in the headlight look, which you'll hear about quite a bit. I had it myself. Because if you tell people that the vast majority of what's in the grocery stores is off limits, then they pretty much look at you like you're crazy and forget it because they just can't do it. But the foods you can eat are organic fruits and vegetables, and we'll talk about why organic, nuts and seeds, hopefully grass-fed, no antibiotic, no hormone, beef, chicken, lamb, pork, so all meats, seafood, shellfish, and eggs. Of course, avoid the things that you're allergic to or that you have an allergic reaction to. And sometimes for the autoimmune protocol, we're removing also the nightshades or any foods in the nightshade family, such as potatoes, and that's white potatoes, not sweet potatoes and yams, tomatoes, sweet and hot peppers, eggplants. If you look it up on the internet, you will be able to find a whole list of foods that are considered to be nightshades. 
So those are the foods to avoid and also the foods that you can eat. Let me talk a little bit about how I came to be on a paleo diet. Because the reality is, is if someone had said from the get go to go on this diet or to be on a paleo diet, when I was super sick back in October of 2006, and almost dead, I would have done it. But it had never come up in conversation. Nobody had ever said none of the nutritionists that I saw or RDs, none of the healthcare providers that I was looking to at that point suggested to go on essentially a whole food diet or a paleo diet. And quite frankly, I put people on a, some variation of a paleo diet before I even knew it was called a paleo diet. Back in 2006, in October of 2006, when I was newly diagnosed with celiac disease by accident from the dermatologist who tested me for celiac disease and dermatitis herpetiformis, which is the rash that goes along with celiac disease. If you have DH, you have celiac disease. I was told to go immediately on a gluten-free diet once my blood was drawn and my skin biopsy were done, which I did. I went on a gluten-free diet. I did not do anything else beyond that at that point and because I just didn't know and did considerably better within a short period of time. And that is despite the fact that my blood test and my skin biopsy came back negative for celiac disease and dermatitis herpetiformis. Hmm. But I was clearly getting better on a gluten-free diet. So my family and my kids actually said, look it, you're getting better on this diet. Why don't you just stay on it and see what happens? So I did. And within a couple months, I was so much better. I started my first business, which is RN on call. And within another month, I was so horrified by what I found out about gluten intolerance and celiac disease. I started the gluten-free RN. And from that day forth, I've pretty much nonstop been talking about gluten intolerance and celiac disease because I realized at that point as a nurse who was very well educated in critical care and emergency and trauma that we'd been duped. We hadn't been taught something extremely important about our health, and that is that food is medicine, which Hippocrates knew. Food is medicine. All diseases start in the gut. Well, that's a hard lesson to learn when you've been a nurse for 15 years and thinking you're doing a good job, and here you find out that there's an entire other component that you didn't know a thing about, and it's the basis for health, which is food and nutrition. What I also found out is that a lot of the teachings through the nutrition programs and RD schools actually don't even talk about gluten intolerance or celiac disease very much. And there is a fair amount of, let's just say, sponsorship from the wheat industry and the dairy industry for those programs, which is fine. It keeps them going, but then the information does get tainted. That has been my experience going to a lot of the conferences. And if you are interested, you should do that too, to find out how the information actually gets disseminated and taught at universities and programs throughout the United States. Just be aware of biases and pay attention to who the sponsors are, even in the media. If you hear anything about gluten intolerance or celiac disease, and maybe it's negative, or maybe people are saying, don't go on a gluten-free diet, it could be dangerous for you, please pay attention to who the sponsors are, because it's typically going to be a food industry giant whose bottom line is being impacted because so many people are going on a gluten-free or dairy-free diet, or some variation of a paleo diet. They want to keep selling their food products or food-like products to the masses. And they're taking it kind of hard in the wallet that a lot of people are not buying their products anymore because their products actually negatively impact people's health. So I was on a gluten-free diet probably for about four years, maybe five. And I thought I was doing great. To celebrate being still alive after four years, on a gluten-free diet, and after my sort of diagnosis with celiac disease, I decided I was going to run a marathon. So I ran the Portland Marathon. It took me forever, but I finished it and started doing half marathons and 5Ks and really becoming somewhat of an avid runner, not very fast, but definitely just a finisher. But I was out there in the pack, running, walking, doing whatever I could to finish. And finish I did. I got my medals very happily. So I thought I was super healthy, but I went in for a 
workup because I figured, you know, everybody should get follow up when they're on a gluten free diet. And I knew that I was celiac despite the fact that I have negative blood tests and a negative skin biopsy because I'm a homozygous gene carrier for DQ2.5. So I went in, I pretty much talked to my healthcare provider, doctor friend, who, and I said, look, these are the labs I want. She added a few more. And so those labs came back and they weren't looking all that great. My B12 was still low. My D3 was, oh my gosh, it was in the toity. And I consider anything less than 40 for a vitamin D level to be critically low. Mm -hmm. I like to see it between 60 and 100, where the oncologists like to see it because it's cancer preventative. So find out what your vitamin D level is and then consider trying to get it up in the 60 to 80 range instead of the teen range, which is where I see a lot of people's vitamin D level or less than that. It's not good. Not good for your brain, not good for any of your body. My vitamin D level was low. I was still slightly anemic. I had things going on. I was like, what the heck? Plus, the doctor had added on an ANA panel, which is an anti-nucleotide antibody panel. And mine was positive. So an ANA panel in general will test for autoimmune diseases. Now, I knew I had seven of them when I started all of this. Sarcoidosis, arthritis, I had Raynaud's, Graves' disease, just to name a few. It was sarcoidosis. There was a few in there. Plus, who knows what else was cooking in my poor little body at that point. But I thought that they were all gone on a gluten-free diet. And with this positive ANA test, I knew that they weren't. Now, celiac disease is considered to be an autoimmune disease, so add that in there. But really, honestly, I thought it was completely better on a gluten-free diet. And at this point, I'd also go on on a gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free diet the more I learned over time. But I really wasn't at my optimal health, hmm. as evidenced by my lab work. So I figured, hmm, there's more work to be done here. But my doctor said, you have to make an appointment with a rheumatologist. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, you're going to have to go on Remicade and uh, methotrexate and a couple other medications. And so you better call quickly because it takes a long time to get in with a rheumatologist. And I said, what? I said, why? And she said, well, so many people have issues with autoimmune diseases that the rheumatologist is really busy. As a nurse, I thought, why do so many people have autoimmune issues? Isn't that the question that people should be asking and should be somewhere able to find a really good answer? So I said, you know what? I'm not going to call the rheumatologist. I'm going to change my diet. My friend Kane Credicut, who is the editor and producer of the Paleo magazine and founder, by the way, said had suggested that I go on a paleo diet. And at the time, I said, oh, I already have to give up so much. Why would I want to give up anything else? It's already so hard. What would I do without rice and corn and the few other things that I can eat. That was my perception again. And so I did the woe is me. But at this point, with my lab work coming back, not all that great. <laughs> and I wanted to be proactive. And I wanted my lab work to look better. Because I sort of felt better. I, I know I felt better. But I wanted my lab work to reflect how good I thought I felt. So I talked to Kane and Tammy Credicott, and I said, what do I do? How do I do this? I got their magazine, the Paleo magazine. I started to read. I read Rob Wolf's book called The Paleo Diet Solution. I started to do a lot of research on the paleo diet, and I myself went on a paleo diet. My family was a little bit not amused at this point. They were like, what, you're going to give up more stuff? Uh, how do we cook for you? What do we do? I went on a paleo diet strictly for a year. So it was 100% gluten-free and dairy-free. And then I further took out grains and I further took out legumes, which are beans and peanuts. I took out all grains. There was not a thing. I didn't do quinoa. I didn't do teff. I didn't do rice or corn, even organic, anything. I didn't care if it was sprouted or soaked or whatever it was. I took them all out because they all can be pro-inflammatory or cause inflammation in a person's body. So my number one goal was to remove all substances that were going to cause inflammation in my body in an effort to allow my body to heal further. So 
The other women in my office also went on a paleo diet. So it was quite fun. I mean, we had our community. I found other people in the community that were also interested on going on a paleo diet. And for the most part, it worked out really well. It wasn't all that hard. I found out what I could eat, organic fruits and vegetables, meat, fish, nuts, and seeds. And that may not sound like a lot, but that's a ton of food. Routinely, I tell people all the time that I can eat from the produce section in the meat department pretty much all year long without eating the same thing twice unless I want to. And I do have some of my favorite dishes that I like to prepare. Again, variations within those dishes are enormous. So I am never bored with what I eat and I eat amazingly well. And pretty much gourmet every day with no cheap filler foods. And that's the key is taking out any of the cheap filler foods or high carbohydrate foods. I don't miss bread. I don't miss any of the rice or beans or things that were keeping me unwell for so long. So I did that for a year. And at the end of the year, I went back into the same doctor's office and I said, hey, I'm ready to get tested again. I want my blood test. And so she did another ANA anti-nucleotide antibody test. She tests my vitamin D, my B12, and several other things. I made another appointment so that we could go over the lab work. And before that appointment, she actually called me up on the phone and she said, Nadine, you have to get in here. You have to come see me. I said, but it's not time for my appointment yet. This is weird. I said, you want me to come in your office before it's actually my appointment? And she said, yeah, just come on in. So I went in and I talked to her for a little bit. And then she gave me my blood test results. She slid them across the table and she said, I don't know how this happened, but your ANA is completely negative. She goes, what have you done? I said, all I did was change my diet. I went on a, my variation of a paleo diet and she said, well, your ANA is negative. You officially do not have an autoimmune disease anymore. I'm like, <laughs> Yay! I was no longer anemic. My D level was between, I think it was about 78 at that point. I will happily show anybody my lab work that wants to see them. It's pretty amazing what did happen just on a paleo diet for myself, and I see it every day with my clients, so I'm happy to share that information. So my B12, my D3, my zinc level, everything increased, which told me that my body's ability to absorb the nutrients that I was eating was improved immensely. So those five years that I was on a gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free diet, my body had healed, but not completely. So at this point, I knew that I was eating good food and that my body was able to absorb it. By the way, despite eating a super good high fat diet, my cholesterol level was perfect, like pristine. The doctor's like, oh my gosh, this is like the cholesterol level of a 20 year old. And here you are a 46 year old woman. So clearly I was on the right path. I was doing the right thing. I no longer had autoimmune diseases that I was just told as a redhead that, you know, you should just expect to get these things. And you should just expect to be anemic because you have red hair. I'm like, what? So a lot of those things that people are told by their physicians or primary care providers are just not based in any science that I can find. I do know that redheads are prone to have anemia, but I also know that redheads are prone to be DQ2 or DQ8 gene carriers, which predisposes them for celiac disease. Hmm. So we're just connecting those dots. We're connectologists. We're making sure that all of the dots are connected and they make sense because a lot of things that people say about gluten intolerance and celiac disease just don't make any sense. So here I am, a year after finding out that my lab work wasn't better, wasn't completely better. And a year later, my lab work is almost pristine. It's perfect. It's great. It's lovely. My doctor is amazed and almost flabbergasted at how much better it is. And again, that's the power of food. Food is medicine. And it's a very, very potent medicine, either very potent poison or very potent medicine for healing. And so ideally, what we're going to use food for is healing our body and making it better so that we can stay as healthy and as vibrant and clear thinking with a solid brain forever. Sharp, sharp, sharp. 
So I really wish I would have known about a paleo diet, not just after I got diagnosed with celiac disease, but way before. A paleo diet is amazing, not just for people that are recovering from organ failure or healing up wounds that typically won't heal. It's great for type 1 diabetics. It's actually great for anybody that is a pre-diabetic or a diabetic, and it's easy to do. People tell me all the time, they're like, oh my gosh, that sounds so hard. I have to fix all my food. Yeah, there's a bit of a learning curve. What is real food? How do you buy real food? Where do you find organic produce? Where do you find grass-fed, no antibiotic, no hormone beef? You have to kind of source your food. I used to eat out of the back of a semi-truck, and you might laugh at that, but you do too. If you eat any hospital food, school food, school at a university, if you eat fast food, you, then you are eating food out of the back of a semi because that's how that food gets transported. I like to think that most of my food comes out of the back of a pickup at this point from the farmer's markets or from the farmers directly. Farmer Dave from La Mancha Farms over in Sweet Home will talk to me about how I want my beef cut up He'll meet me in a parking lot somewhere, or he will deliver my beef to me in the back of his truck. I'll load it up into my car, or several times he's come to my house and helped me put it in my freezer. That's how close I am to the food that I eat. So I have, believe it or not, a half a moo cow in my freezer. I bought a freezer. It's full of food that I've either picked or farmers have supplied for me, mostly meat, fish, blueberries, any of the berries that we can get around here in Oregon, they freeze great and I can eat them all year long. But I really wish somebody would have told me about this sooner. So I'm telling you now, if this is the first you've heard of a paleo diet, I would consider that it's a good thing to investigate for yourself because you will get better faster and your body will heal more completely. I do get people that are critically ill out of ICUs at times that have either been in there for GI bleeding or having their bowels resected or some overwhelming infection, and I will put them immediately on some variation of a paleo diet, and they get better faster. Honestly, at this point, when people listen, they don't die. If they immediately go on a paleo diet or some variation of a gluten-free, dairy-free diet without any grains, they get better. I've had some people that didn't listen, and unfortunately, they have died. So gluten-free paleo diet, not only did I get better, my body get better, I was absorbing more nutrients, but my body composition changed. I didn't lose a pound, but my body composition changed so much, I went from a size 8 pants to somewhere between a size 4 and a 6. I can't even explain it. It was the weirdest thing. My pants size changed, even though really I was still 140 pounds on a five, nine and three quarters frame, which, you know, was pretty good. I was happy as a size eight, but I was more happy as a size four to six. I thought that was pretty funny. So at this point in 2017, I am maintaining myself on my variation of a paleo diet that does not include eggs. Hmm. Yeah. Eggs are not dairy. They are actually uh, from a chicken. Just so you know, I get asked that question occasionally. But my friend Sam, who worked for me for a period of time, said, hey, you know what? I gave up eggs when we went camping and we forgot to pack them, and I feel much better. So I think you should give up eggs, too. I thought, "Mm, I don't want to give give up my eggs because I really like my eggs. But I did because I play with my diet just as much as anybody else, and I do experiments. I am my own science experiment. Gave up those eggs, and you know what? It helped more stuff healed. I like that. So as a country, we are not going in the correct direction. We want to make sure that we reverse some of the epidemics that are we know are coming down the pike, such as diabetes and whether that's type 1 or type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune disease that's insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. And type 2 is considered to be exercise and diet controlled. However, there's a lot of type two diabetics that also have to take insulin, we'd like to reverse that also. The obesity epidemic, 68% of our population is overweight. That's crazy. So obviously we need to fix that. And diet and exercise is, is taught in medical school or in any of the schools is 
not going to fix it, obviously, because it's getting worse and worse and worse. So the definition of crazy is continue to tell people to do the same thing, change your diet and exercise, and expect different results. Well, you know what? Go on a paleo diet, start walking, and watch those pounds go away because they do. I do recommend that people adopt a variation of a paleo diet with some help. And that can be helped by myself or a functional medicine practitioner, somebody that actually knows what they're doing. Because for most people, this is a great way to get better and they heal really quickly. But we've had a couple instances where people go from a standard American diet or a SAD diet. And for some reason, they get kicked into acute renal failure. Hmm. Or they end up with just some crazy things that we want to try to prevent them if we can. Some people can't process oxalates and we need to be really careful of when we change their diet. I know it sounds crazy, but food is medicine. And if we don't use it correctly or follow a little bit of a process with it and keep an eye on people, things can go awry. What are the benefits of a paleo diet? Well, it can help you clear up lingering gluten issues. If you keep getting gluten or there's cross-contamination issues, it can take those issues away because you're not eating many, if any, foods that are processed. So that's another way to avoid cross-contamination. You can actually achieve sustainable weight loss just by changing your diet and exercising. And sometimes that's just minimally. That's just walking or getting started. Trust me. Once you go gluten-free and dairy-free and on a paleo diet, you're going to have a lot more energy. That is one of the benefits. Clearer and smoother skin. Your skin is a detox organ. So if your skin looks like heck, like if you have a lot of rashes or it's itchy or it's irritated or, you know, I used to think I couldn't wear wool sweaters because, you know, just would my skin was super sensitive. Again, one of those redheaded things. A lot of us actually get clearer, smoother skin, and several of my friends say, you know what, people have been telling me that I look younger. Well, once you start absorbing your nutrients, your vitamin A, D, E, and K, which are your fat-soluble vitamins, and those are responsible for your mood, your connective tissue, your skin, healing, so important. Your stronger immune system, and we talked about that in episode 8 with the CDC and the antibiotic resistant threats that are concerning to the CDC. So we want to improve our immune system so that we can fight off diseases and viruses, bacteria, all kinds of things, keep our body healthy. One of the really clear benefits is that people sleep better and everybody needs to sleep better. Sleep hygiene is one of the number one issues and concerns I hear from people. Sleep is essential for your health. Work to get eight to 10 hours of sleep every night. And I do mean that really honestly, because what happens when you sleep is your body heals. And if you're not sleeping eight to 10 hours a night, then your body is going to have a hard time healing. And I even recommend that people take a multivitamin, a liquid multivitamin in the morning and at night, especially when they're first diagnosed with celiac disease or gluten intolerance, so that those vitamins and minerals and the trace vitamins and minerals are all there so that your body can heal at night. You do have to take it with fat. Take every supplement and make sure that every time you eat, you are eating with a significant amount of super good high fat. But right now, let's talk about a little bit about sleep and the fact that when you are sleeping or you're in your bed, which should be very comfortable, you do spend a third of your life in bed. So we're up typically, you know, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. That's me, by the way. (laughs) I'm always in bed by nine. If you know me at all, I turn into a pumpkin at nine o'clock. I'm in bed and then I sleep usually until five, six or seven o'clock in the morning but I don't have any computers in my room. I limit my screen time at night, which means I don't have the computer on at night, certainly not when I'm in bed. I do read in bed at night, which some people don't recommend, but I sleep really well. Some people consider me to be an Olympic sleeper. (laughs) I have an ability to put my head down on the pillow, take a couple nice deep breaths, and I am out. 
And I am out until the morning. So I don't get up to pee. I don't get up and wander around the house. I don't get up and do anything else. I'm just asleep. But I had to work at that. I had to really work to attain that level of sleeping because I didn't sleep for a long time. And I would wake up and I'd be extremely fatigued. I'd still have to carry out my activities of daily life, my ADLs, and work and take care of my family. But I was not sleeping very well. So now that I'm sleeping, I have a lot more energy. I'm a lot happier. And it's extremely important for you to work on sleep hygiene and making sure that you are getting enough sleep every night, eight to 10 hours, and just really work toward that goal. We did talk a little bit about fat, and it's important that you realize that every cell in your body needs fat, every hormone needs cholesterol to heal, every cell in your body needs fat to function appropriately, And you need fat in your diet with everything you eat so that you can absorb all of those nutrients, especially the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. If you are taking your vitamin D, but you're not taking it with fat, believe it or not, you're not going to absorb it. So it's vitally important that you do take vitamin D3 and any of your other fat-soluble vitamins, A, E, and K, with fat, okay? Very vitally important. And that fat can be anything from avocados, grass-fed meats, high-quality olive oil, coconut oil, nuts, nut butters. Remember, we're not doing peanut butter. We're doing things like almond butter, cashew butter. Pumpkin seed butter is my favorite. It's one of the most nutrient-dense butters. Pick a butter, pistachio nut butter, and get all of them because they all have different oils, really, really good fats, though, fish oils and eggs. So I don't care if it's fish oil tablets or you eat a lot of salmon, just pick some really good fish oil. And if you can eat eggs and they don't bother you at all, make sure that you're eating some really good high quality eggs that you get from a farmer. We get ours from Midway Farms from a family that is entirely celiac. So their chickens are fed with kitchen scraps and they forage. So they're free range chickens, truly. They're out pecking away at the bugs. And anytime you see eggs that are advertised as vegetarian, please keep in mind that those chickens are fed grains because chickens are not vegetarians. Usually they're out in the grass finding worms and bugs and all kinds of things. Not vegetarian by any stretch of the imagination. So if you see that on your egg carton, please know that those chickens are primarily grain fed, which is not what chickens eat. So we're trying to get the chickens back to what they eat. And we're trying to get us humans back to what we should be eating, which is essentially fruits and vegetables that are organic, meats and fish. And that is 100% grass fed, no antibiotic, no hormones, beef, lamb, pork, seafood, and eggs. But, you know, avoid the the foods that you're currently allergic to and realize that some of the foods that you're allergic to are going to go away. I had anaphylaxis to garlic when I was so sick and I could not figure out what the heck was going on. I love garlic, but suddenly I'd get hives and my throat would close up. I'm like, I can't eat garlic anymore. Believe it or not, that allergy went away and I no longer have an allergy to garlic because my immune system has settled down and it's not crazy wacko anymore. So I hope you've gotten a lot of information on the how, why, and what to eat on a paleo diet. There's lots of resources. Paleo Magazine is one of them. A great first read is Rob Wolf's A Paleo Diet Solution. There are a multitude of paleo cookbooks, really excellent resources. I always do recommend the Practical Paleo book as a first one. There's also The Paleo Approach by my good friend Sarah Ballantyne. It's amazing, which also comes with two cookbooks, The Paleo Approach Cookbook and The Healing Kitchen. Really, honestly, there's so many cookbooks out there. Go find the one that actually speaks to you and will give you the best information for where you're at and what you're trying to do. Find a practitioner, a healthcare provider, somebody like me, the gluten-free RN, or a functional medicine practitioner, either a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a chiropractor, 
somebody that actually knows about how to treat underlying issues and help people get better using food and get back the health that you deserve and you should have had right along. It's much easier to maintain your health than it is to try to regain it. Trust me. (laughs) As a nurse, I'm, I'm just amazed at how better my body is on a paleo diet, but also how sick I had to get before I got the correct information. And it was tricky to get it. So here I am. I'm going to give you everything I have on this podcast as far as how to get better faster and resources. You're going to hopefully leave this podcast with lots of ideas and the urge to do more research on these topics. Thank you once again for joining me, Nadine Groskowiak, on the Gluten-Free RN Podcast, Episode 9. If you've enjoyed this episode or any of the other preceding episodes, please feel free to leave a rating on iTunes or an actual review. Those help drive people to the Gluten-Free RN podcast and are very helpful. I would very much appreciate it. And if you have any comments or questions, you can either leave them on my website, which is www.glutenfreern.com or send me an email at nadine at glutenfreern.com. I look forward to hearing from you and I also look forward to the next few episodes of the Gluten-Free RN podcast. Thank you for joining us and until next time, have a great day and to your health.